This is a Sandy Boy Productions podcast. Welcome to the Urban Pharmacy Podcast, where we help women remove the overwhelm of living their most holistic life. This is the place to find evidence-based nutrition tactics, healthy lifestyle and wellness tips, abundance mindset, and easily implementable low-tox living strategies so you can rise up to your full potential and protect your family's health. I'm your host, Stacey Heine, certified holistic nutritionist and better living advocate. Now, let's get empowered with some simple swaps that make a big impact for optimal wellness. It's episode three of the Urban Pharmacy Podcast, and today we're getting into plant-based eating. Surprise, surprise, right? But we're also getting into entrepreneurship and mindset and how to transition to a plant-based lifestyle if that's something that interests you, in addition to some cooking tips along the way. My guest is my friend, Lauren Kretzer, who is a professionally trained vegan chef and recipe developer. She is a graduate of the Natural Gourmet Institute in New York City and also holds and is a fellow graduate, a certificate in plant-based nutrition from Cornell University. Lauren has worked throughout the tri-state area in Michelin-starred kitchens, privately in the kitchens of families and celebrities, and currently is working as a recipe developer for international wellness brands, restaurants, New York Times best-selling authors, and popular media outlets such as Vogue, Well and Good, and Veg News. She is an advocate for eating seasonally, locally, and believes that food can be our greatest healer. Lauren currently lives in Northern New Jersey with her husband, two young daughters, and rescue dog. When she's not cooking, she enjoys being out in nature with her family and reading. She can be found on Instagram at Lauren underscore Kretzer and online at laurenkretzer.com. You do not want to miss out on her lovely recipes. And um, one of the ones that spoke to me just recently was her mushroom bacon. We need to get on that recipe. All right, before I take any more of your time, let's get into the episode. I hope you enjoy it. All right, welcome, Lauren. I am so excited to have you here on the Urban Pharmacy Podcast. You are all things food, and I cannot wait to chat with you. So glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. All righty. So let's just dig right in. I know that you are a vegan chef and a recipe creator. And I heard you say in an interview with Dr. Yummy that you used to go home from work and watch Rachel Ray all the time. And that spoke to me so much because I used to do the same. I would come home and I would watch Food Network for hours. That's literally all I cared about after getting off of work. I was wondering what recipe I was going to make that night. Um, You know, all of the different things that I was going to try to create. So tell me about your decision to become a vegan chef. Where did this all stem from? And a little bit about your plant-based journey. Sure. So the decision to go into the culinary world was kind of one that I didn't really expect. I, as a child and as a teenager, and even in my college years, I never really thought that that was going to be my trajectory professionally. Um, Basically for a a very long time, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I, um, as a kid, I wanted to for a while, I wanted to be a musician. I'm actually a classically trained cellist. And so um, that was really my focus for 
most of my life um, up until college, really. Um, and then when I was in school in uh, my undergrad years, I really didn't know what I wanted to do after after college. I decided I didn't want to go the musician route, but I wasn't sure what what I really wanted to be. So I just picked majors based on things that were interesting to me. So I was a double major in English and psychology. I just figured I'll enjoy those classes. I'll probably do better in those classes since I'm actually interested in the subject matter and I'll figure it out later on. Um, mm -hmm. And then I graduated and I really didn't, I didn't really want to go to um, get my master's. I re didn't really want to go to graduate school. Um, so I tried just sort of getting my foot into the professional world um, any way I could. And I just basically ended up through total coincidence in the financial world, never an interest of mine. I don't think I took a single finance class in my life, um, but yet I ended up working on Wall Street. I started out working at Morgan Stanley, eventually went over to TD uh, doing campus recruiting. So that was really my bread and butter for a long time. And for a while it was really exciting and it was great and it was fun. And I was like, wow, who knew? Like I never thought I would end up here, but um, I really liked my career, but Basically, the financial crash in 2008, 2009 just took a lot out of me. Um, I had to walk people out of their jobs when they were getting laid off since I was part of HR. It was very draining. And then once it was over, even though my job, you know, I survived and I managed to keep my job somehow, it, it just, the landscape was totally different. Um, it was an entirely different culture. Everything was changing. I didn't feel secure in my job anymore. Um, and even though I was able to, retain my employment. I like, like you said, I found myself going home and just dreaming about food. Um, I'm not really sure why, I guess, because I grew up and food was always important in my family. Um, I come from two immigrant families. My father is Sicilian and my mother um, moved here from Argentina when she was about nine or 10 years old. And in both of those cultures, food is, you know, everything. And so I grew up, that's what I knew. That's all, you know, all we ever talked about as a family was what we were eating and what meal was next. So it kind of made sense that that's what I, that's, that's how I relaxed at the end of the day was cooking a meal. And, um, at the time I didn't have a family, so I would just be cooking for myself really. And so I would watch these shows for inspiration and just for ideas. And then, um, as I mentioned in Dr. Yami's podcast, I started doing cooking classes with the recruits that I was bringing into the firm. And when uh, we would do these cooking classes as team building exercises, essentially, I would find myself just kind of wishing I was on the other side. I was like, I want to be the one teaching these classes and mm -hmm. coming up with these recipes. And so, um, so something I struggled with for a couple of years, I just knew it, it was not right for me to stay in this job that I wasn't interested any, in it anymore. But it seemed like a major financial and personal risk to completely shift gears. Um, I didn't have someone paying my rent for me. So, you know, it's not like my parents were kind of subsidizing this decision. Um, I, but finally, I got to the point where I was like, I can't, um, I can't do this anymore. I can't, you know, go to work hating it. So I quit my job, I resigned, and I enrolled in culinary school. And the rest is history. And just, you know, since then, it's just been reaffirmed to me over and over and over that it was the right choice. Um, I certainly don't make as much money as I as I used to on Wall Street, but um, I feel infinitely more fulfilled. I'm in charge of my own life. I have my make my own hours. I decide how much work or how little work I want to take on for the most part. I'm in control of that. And it's just been a, a huge blessing for me. Oh, my gosh. So powerful. I share... I, I never came from the corporate world, but I did own a brick and mortar um, as a Pilates studio owner. And I decided to, because another opportunity came my, my way, which was still in the healthy living space. I, I decided to take a leap and sell my studio and, you know, still be an entrepreneur, but take that big risk of working from home. And it's so scary. And, but like you said, you have had like reminder after reminder that, it was the right decision for you. Yeah. So, you know, it started for you as a gut feeling. Um, what did it look like for you as you became an entrepreneur? I mean, did you research, you know, like average income of a, of a chef? Like, how did it look like to you to really just kind of go from corporate to on your own yeah, so I, I, I tried a little bit to get a sense for what I could make, but it seemed that in the culinary industry, it really, it's dramatic, the difference 
from, you know, say a line cook at a restaurant to a private chef to recipe development, like the income level was just all over the place. And one thing that became clear to me early on is even though I've always enjoyed restaurant work, I I did a couple externships and I did a lot of volunteering just to kind of get my foot in the door in the industry and decide if it was for me. Um, it's, It's generally very low paying work and the hours are insane and it's incredibly hard on your body physically. So I knew pretty early on that that really wasn't for me. Um, When I started private chefing, it was slightly less physically intense, but still really tiring, but I was making better money. Um, So I kind of thought for a while, that's really what I wanted to do. And um, otherwise, I I didn't really know any, I I didn't really know the income that I would make doing anything else. I just, I, all I knew was that I was incredibly motivated to succeed and I was going to figure it out. And I also was prepared in the event that it didn't work out. I was prepared to go back to the corporate world. So even though that's not something I wanted to do, I was like, at the end of the day, I have to pay my bills and I'm not going to default on my rent just to kind of pursue this dream of mine. So I was going to do it as long as it made sense. And thankfully I managed to keep making a living from it enough to pay my bills and save a little bit. And eventually I felt a lot more secure in my career. I love that. So you brought up two things, two things that I have, well, two things that I've had experience with too, with, I used to work in the food industry as well within like a grocery store in, in bakeries, and then also helping people who were private chefs with catering. And you're right. The vast, the vast array of being paid within the food world is so it's just so um, large and can differentiate, uh, you know, from market to market and depending on what you're doing. So, and then also you mentioned that, you know, consistency and then determination were, were things that were the lifeline as you began your entrepreneurial life. So, um, you know, do you have to do anything as an entrepreneur on a daily basis to remind yourself to keep going? Do you have some sort of habits or magic tricks that you practice? Because being an entrepreneur is not easy. Working for yourself is not easy. You have to be really organized. You have to be really dedicated and you have to have a plan. Yeah, I definitely think successful entrepreneurs, and I'm not necessarily putting myself in this category because there are definitely people out there who make a lot more money than me and who are probably a lot more organized than me. But, you know, the fact that I've been able to make it work says something, but I think um, it's definitely a personality type. I think you have to be just one of those people who is always reaching for the next rung on the ladder, who, you know, doesn't really rest on your laurels. And I think sometimes that can work against me. Um, You know, I just, I don't want to say I never feel satisfied because that's not true. I definitely feel satisfied in my life and in, in my job, but there's always just this fire in me of like, what's next. And I think you have to have that. And I think um, some people are born with it and some people aren't. And so I think that's, that's what, has helped me definitely throughout. And then otherwise, in terms of systems, I'm still working on this for myself. I just, I'm always just trying to build out what I already have. So, you know, if I have, you know, several steady clients, I'm always looking to add another one to that roster because I recognize, you know, the landscape, the landscape can shift at any time, as we saw in 2020. Um, You know, I certainly lost work in, in in the last year, but I was grateful that I had kind of rustled up enough clients where I had some stuff to fall back on. Um, And that's always been, you know, something I've, I've tried to do is have like a backup plan, try to have, you know, a little bit more than I think I can bite off a little bit more than I think I can chew. And I usually can make it work. I'm a little bit stressed out as a result, but you know, there's always work to do, which is good. So, yeah. Oh gosh. I love it. Yeah. We're as entrepreneur, as entrepreneurs, I think you're so right we're always consistently climbing up the mountain and it just keeps going. And I think that that is what makes people succeed in a, in a life like this when, you know, and success looks different for everybody. It might not be monetary or, or just being super organized. You know, it is about fulfilling yourself. And that is going to bring me to my last question about entrepreneurship with you. What, tips do you have for people who are interested in following their heart and taking the leap into the unknown that comes alongside working for themselves? Um, I mean, I would say the thing that, uh, that I can draw from my own personal experience that I would want to pass on to someone else is that make sure it's not a fleeting thing. Um, you know, you might get really into something, 
you know, over quarantine or, you know, in your free time and think that that thing is your passion. And I would just say, don't jump ship too soon, you know, try your best if it's possible, it's not possible for everyone to dabble in it in your free time. If you don't really have free time, I would say just try to scratch that itch in other ways, like listen to podcasts about it, read books about it, maybe work on a blog or an Instagram account that focuses on that particular thing. And then if that feeling isn't going away, that feeling that this is what I'm meant to do, then it might be time to start researching it, you know, see what your career avenues are, um, different ways to make money. Um, ask yourself realistically, do I have the time to do this? I can say with like 100% certainty that I'm not sure and I would have been able to build this career after having my first child. I just don't think it would have been possible. Um, and if it had been, I think I would have burnt myself into the ground. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's certainly easier to do things with, before kids. Um, and if you already have children, you know, having a partner who can support you financially is huge. Um, if you don't have that, then I would say, you know, maybe wait till your kids are a little older because it's definitely a grind. There's definitely hustle involved. Not everybody makes money right away. I went through a solid year where I really wasn't making that much money. Um, so, you know, that's just the advice that I feel would have benefited me, um, you know, hearing it back, back in the day when I was trying to make this shift. That's all really good advice advice. And I, I agree with you. I only have one, I have one child, but um, I know of course it would be more difficult with multiple and uh, yeah, your, your brain matter when you become a mom also it just kind of diminishes a little bit. Yeah, right. So, uh, <laughs> so, so as a new mom, I think that's really good advice. Um, maybe you can become an entrepreneur as a new mom in one way, but when, when it becomes working just for yourself without having maybe like a mentor to guide you and, you know, like you're creating it from the very ground up. I think that's really, really great advice. Do it before the kids come or when they're a little older and you actually have the brain capacity to, to <laughs> succeed. I think right. that's great advice. Um, okay. So tell me, we're going to get into food and plant-based slash veganism. Where did your transition point happen in your life when you decided to go plant-based or vegan? Sure. So when I was a kid, um, I grew up eating, I wouldn't say the standard American diet, because as I mentioned, I come from immigrant families. So we always had different things on our table. We weren't really like a cheeseburger or McDonald's family. Um, but that being said, I definitely ate meat, uh, for, for a little while when I was born. And obviously, um, toddlerhood, early childhood, I ate pretty much everything. I didn't, I, I was never really a fan of fish, but beyond that, you know, I had it all. And around, I, I want to say like when I was seven or eight years old about my father decided to become a vegetarian. He ended up reading uh, diet for a new America by John Robbins, who by like complete um, serendipitous things I ended up working with in the last few years. So it's just kind of crazy how it's come full circle. But John Robbins wrote this book that changed my dad's life he decided he was not going to eat meat anymore and never put any pressure on us, just kind of did his thing and just, you know, told my mom that's how he was eating from now on. And we just kind of all, I don't remember like my thought process too clearly at the time, but I remember just being like, I don't want to eat animals either. And so I became mostly vegetarian right away. Um, pretty much overnight. I just stopped eating any red meat, pork products. Like I said, I wasn't really a fish person. Um, so that was all gone. And then chicken, because it was the eighties, my mom was like, Oh, my kids need protein. My kids need, you know, this, that, you know, she was, I think she was afraid to kind of have us cause we were little, we were like, like I said, I was seven or eight. My younger sister was probably like five at the time. My older sister, you know, she was in her early adolescent years. And so they're all like critical growth periods. And for the eighties, when this information wasn't, or early nineties, this information wasn't so readily available about nutrition and, you know, thriving on a vegan or vegetarian diet. So I kept eating chicken for a while. And then finally, I remember I was at my friend's house and her parents were having a dinner party and they were preparing chicken. And I had seen raw chicken before, but I don't know why. It was just like that one time I saw it and I just was like, oh no, no more. <laughs> and so that was really it for me. And I never looked back. I haven't had meat, not even a bite since. And um, I was very happily vegetarian, lacto-ovo vegetarian, pretty much my whole rest of childhood and early adulthood. And then I went to culinary school and was exposed to veganism really for the first time. I had a couple of vegan classmates. Um, some of the staff members were more on the plant-based side. 
And that's really when I started learning about veganism. And so just my curiosity was piqued. I didn't think right away, oh, this is for me. I just wanted to learn more um, because that's the style of cooking I was being trained in. So I started listening to Colleen Patrick Goudreau's podcast, Food for Thought, and that pretty much single-handedly changed me. I would listen to her and the way that she talked about veganism was just in such a joyful manner. Like she didn't sound deprived. She didn't sound like she was struggling. She just sounded the opposite. Like she was thriving. Like this was the person that she had always been meant to be. And so I was kind of like, oh, I want to, I want to feel that way about my food. And I uh, gradually started cutting out dairy. Um, first, I cut out things that I didn't love. So I was like eating yogurt because I would read that you're supposed to have protein at breakfast. So I cut yogurt out of my diet. Um, not because, you know, I didn't love it. Just, I just decided I, I don't really need this anymore. Mm-hmm. And then eventually I started, you know, using soy milk instead of dairy milk. And it was all very gradual. And then within about a year, I just decided to, to try to be vegan. Um, and it was great. I was gentle with myself. I wasn't all or nothing. I allowed myself to have cheese on pizza and that's literally it. I didn't, I didn't make any other exceptions. I would have cheese on pizza, like maybe two or three times a month for a little while. And then that gradually went down to one time a month. And then pretty much after, you know, a short while it was down to nothing. Um, and I don't miss it at all. I feel like this is the way I was always meant to eat. I feel like my body is so happy <laughs> with this diet and this lifestyle. And um, it actually helped me overcome a bunch of body shame and dietary issues that I used to have body image issues. I feel like now I can just eat without guilt. I don't have to like just struggle with calorie counts anymore. I just know that everything I'm putting into my body is good for me. Oh, I love it. Oh my gosh. You touched on so many things. Um, Diet for a new America with John Robbins is amazing. And ocean Robbins is amazing. They're Mm -hmm. both amazing human beings. They are. Oh my goodness gracious. And, um, you also mentioned how you saw the chicken and you decided that was it. Like there, I had a very similar experience, um, right around the time that I had decided to stop eating meat or at least red meat because of a documentary called, um, fast food nation with Avril Levine. Mm -hmm. Um, that really, when I saw the processing of the cows, I was just like, what? Like my whole world was flipped upside down and I couldn't, I started making that connection, right? Like that these are actually animals becoming food on our plate. And then I was at the state fair, um, that year in the summer and I had a turkey leg. Now it wasn't red meat, but it was a turkey leg and I was still eating poultry and it was the drumstick and it had I mean, this might sound gross, but it had hair on it still. Oh my god! <laughs> and I was like, holy, it was like a whole <laughs> new connection. Uh, I was like, oh my God, this was just alive, right? And I could not, I could never eat poultry again. I was, I was just like, no more. It's, it's crazy how people have that moment of awakening and connection, you know, like, like we both said, we both like theoretically knew, of course, it's an animal. Yeah. Um, and my daughter, she, I have a six year old and she was asking me about when I ate meat as a kid. And she's like, how did you not know it was a chicken? I'm like, I, I don't really know. I think I did know, but I didn't know, you know? Well, yeah. And we aren't marketed to, I mean, like if they showed like on a, on a commercial, like with chicken nuggets, and ketchup on the plate. And then like little chickens running around, maybe would have, we would have made that connection. Right. Right. We are just very not marketed uh, to in that way at all to make the Mm -hmm. connection is very opposite uh, so that we don't make that connection. I truly believe that. Hey friend. Before we get too far into this episode, I want to be sure you know about how the environment plays a role on your overall health. For over a decade, I've been learning so much about the lack of health regulation in the personal care and food industries, and that's actually one of the reasons why I started this show. You deserve to know how to protect you and your family from unwanted body burden, and I share further information about how to make better choices and vote with your dollar in our private Facebook community called The Urban Pharmacy. On that note, I want to let you know about one of the easiest ways that we've switched to safer, and that's through my favorite clean beauty brand called Beauty Counter. Your skin is your largest organ, and what you put on it every day matters a lot. And with a low-carbon footprint, cruelty-free formulations, and high-performing results, 
I haven't found a better beauty brand than Beauty Counter in over five years of working with this mission-driven brand. To learn more and shop clean, head to mybetterbeauty.com. Um, okay. So let's get into some rapid fire questions about cooking okay, and food. So do you have any tips on cooking that isn't overly time consuming? I fielded these questions. So, um, these are questions from people that we know. Okay. Um, you know, I think people just tend to overcomplicate dinner in their mind. They think it has to be like a recipe. And truth be told, when I'm not working, like the food I make for myself is as far from like a composed recipe as you can get. Like I, I literally, like, I, I don't think, you know, you're definitely not doing yourself or your family a disservice by, you know, just making a pot of rice, which, you know, most people know how to do. And if you don't, there are, you know, millions of websites that will teach you how a pot of rice, maybe a, um, a legume or a bean, like some chickpeas or lentils, you can either buy them canned or you can prepare them yourself. Um, lentils are super easy. You don't have to soak them and they take about like, less than a half hour to make. Um, then a vegetable, like I would choose a green vegetable or a non-starchy vegetable at that point. Um, broccoli, cauliflower, um, kale, spinach, whatever you like, saute that. Um, you can do it in a little broth if you don't use oil or you could use a little olive oil, some garlic. And then if you are a sauce person, you can make a very simple sauce just by mixing some tahini with water, adding some of your favorite spices to that and drizzling over it. And that is a meal. Um, in terms of other quick meals, uh, you know, just, just try to spend a Sunday spending or Saturday, whenever you have time, um, going on the internet, looking at your cookbooks and finding meals that don't have that many steps, just find things that have three or four steps that don't have a ton of complicated ingredients and just bookmark them, put them in a folder or, you know, add little tabs to your cookbooks that way when it's a Tuesday night at five o'clock and you're freaking out about what to make for dinner, at least you know you have these recipes that have ingredients that you typically have on hand or they're not gonna take you very long. Um, and uh, to that point, meal planning can work for people too. So if you're one of those people who doesn't really have a very well-stocked pantry or a very well-stocked refrigerator, I think it would really benefit you from spending some time over the weekend to figure out what you're cooking that week and then buying those ingredients. And if you don't have time to meal plan, then definitely build out your pantry and um, your freezer stash with frozen vegetables, frozen fruits. So that way you can make meals on the fly. Awesome. I love it. Super helpful. And that brought me to a question that I have. What are your top three spices that you oh, would God, recommend? Just hard. three. I know that three is like, that's just so hard. <laughs> <laughs> but if, it's really hard. But if you had three spices that you like have to have, what would you what would you say? Um, well, probably crushed red pepper flakes. I love heat. So I put them, you know, I put it in pretty much everything. Um, turmeric, because I think, you know, if you've read about turmeric, you know, it's basically medicine. Um, it is such a powerful spice, anti-inflammatory, um, cancer preventing. It's just incredible. And it has this beautiful golden hue. Um, so I usually add turmeric to, to most of my food. And then I would say beyond that, um, maybe cumin, because cumin just kind of adds depth of flavor to tons of Latin cuisine, South American cuisine. I love it in, of course, like Indian food. Um, so you can adapt it to a lot of different um, foreign types of food. And it just really it has such a distinct flavor. It's so lovely. L lovely. Yum. So and two of those even all three could be used in that simple tahini sauce that you were just talking about. Oh, totally. I mean, yeah. Delicious. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I love those three. Um, all right. So do you have any recommendations for buying products in bulk while storing them for freshness? Um, I would say don't, I, I definitely am a, a big advocate for bulk purchasing. I think it's easier on the environment. It's more cost effective. That being said, just because something's cheap and environmentally friendly, don't buy more than you can use because then you're going to have a problem storing it. And also it's going to end up going bad and then you've kind of wasted food. So only buy what you think you'll use in the next month, I would say, 
and then um, store in just airtight glass jars. So mason jars are perfect. Or if you don't have mason jars, just reuse um, marinara sauce jars. So I save those. I clean them out. I'll remove the labels. Little jam jars, um, beautiful for that. So just repurpose your old jars and store it in there. Try to keep it in a dark, cool area of your home. So definitely away from direct sunlight. Um, don't store things right above your, your stove. Um, it'll just get too hot. So often a pantry is perfect. And um, just try to use things uh, and anything that's going bad soon, obviously use those first, then the things that will stay fresh or longer. Mm -hmm. Love that. I love using ball jars and repurposing jars for all the things, grains and beans and um, I will say with nuts, I think a lot of the times people might buy those in bulk. Um, do you recommend putting nuts in the refrigerator or freezer? Or how, how do you recommend that storage system? Yeah. So if you have the room, definitely, um, you can store them in your freezer for sure, or your fridge. I tend to keep my, um, my nuts, at, um, my nuts in the pantry because I just have so many for recipe development. It would like literally take over my freezer, but I keep things like hemp seeds, flax seeds, chia seeds. I keep those in ball jars in my fridge. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Got it. Awesome. Okay. Vegan staples, um, in the kitchen. Uh, definitely some brown rice, um, quinoa. Um, I'm personally not gluten-free, so I love things like farro. So just a different variety of whole grains would be awesome. Um, some whole grain flour to bake with. I love spelt flour. I love whole wheat pastry flour. Um, those things, oat flour are great to keep on hand. Um, let's see what else. Um, all different kinds of nuts and seeds, like you said, mm -hmm. all different types of legumes. So I love keeping chickpeas, lentils. Um, I use both brown lentils and red lentils, um, kidney beans, black beans. Um, what else? Lots of different spices. So, you know, whatever cuisine you like best, stock up on all the spices used in that particular cuisine. And then some um, vinegars are great to have on hand. I usually have like a lighter vinegar, like um, a rice vinegar, apple cider vinegar, and then some balsamic vinegar as well. Um, if you cook with oil, you have a couple um, high quality unrefined oils on hand. If not, then you can absolutely cook without them. Um, I like to have a few veggie stocks on hand. So you can either keep those in your freezer if they're fresh, um, if they're something that you make yourself, or you can certainly buy the, the cartons of uh, veggie stock at the supermarket. Um, I love having nut butters on hand. Those are great for baking and just for snacking. And uh, I feel like I'm forgetting something. I'm, I'm assuming you want like pantry items. Well, no, that's really good. I think that that's an amazing list. I don't think you're forgetting the staples. Oats for making breakfast. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So those are the things that I keep in my pantry uh, most, most of the time. And those are the things I reach for pretty much every week when I cook. Yeah. So three things on that. I love, I also love spelt flour. I think it, it, it bakes very well. Um, if you're looking for something other than just a white flour, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I've been trying to master spelt sourdough. Mm -hmm. um, I really like spelt flour. And then also with oats, if you don't have the room to have both oat flour and oats, you can always make your own oat flour, right? Mm -hmm. With the blender. And then, oh gosh, what was the last thing that you mentioned? Oh, you mentioned beans. Okay, of course. So lots and lots of beans, legumes in your pantry. Are you a fan of an instant pot? Or do you think that the flavor is different when you soak and make them slow and low? That's like the existential question. I have such a love hate relationship with my instant pot. I, I, I feel love it. like I love it. And I hate it too. It takes I feel like as a mom, I should be using it like all the time because everyone's like, it's life changing yet. I, I hate not being able to see my food when it's cooking. Mm, and okay. I feel like there have been instances where I've, you know, followed instructions and I've cooked beans and I open up the pot and they're like literally hard, you know, and I'm just right. like, Oh my God. And I have to like crank it back up to pressure. So I think if like, you know, if you, if you have the time to master it, it looks like an incredible device, yeah. but <laughs> I feel like beans are the kind of thing where if you're going to cook them low and slow, it's such inactive cooking that you can put them on and like do your laundry, answer your emails, feed your kids lunch. Like you don't need to be stirring them. So mm -hmm. I don't really mind making them the old fashioned way. Cause I feel like I can do other things while they're cooking. I like that. So, and I, I love and hate it because it, takes the time out. And you're right. I've totally tried like garbanzo beans, chickpeas. I've opened that lid and they're like not cooked at all mm -hmm. multiple times. So that's happened to me. And then also 
it's kind of like a microwave. Like we got rid of our microwave when we built our house over 10 years ago, we didn't even put a microwave in. And, um, just because not, not even talking about health issues or anything like that, because that's totally, um, debatable, but I just feel like people are living in such a fast world that mm-hmm. they're not connecting to their food yeah. at all. Yeah. And, you know, so the instant pot kind of takes that connection piece, taking a bean from soaking to maybe even sprouting to then cooking it. Like it just takes that, it takes the connection of your food away. And I think yeah. in this day and age, we are so disconnected to our food mm-hmm. um, that that is a, one of the reasons why we are all so sick. So I, 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 I totally agree. And yeah. I, I completely, completely sympathize with, you know, not having time. I like, totally. as I mentioned, I'm a mother of two very young kids. I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old. Mm-hmm. I do not have child care. I work, you know, so I, I get not having the time. Um, mm-hmm. That being said, because I grew up the way I did, where food was so, um, such an expression of love mm-hmm. from my grand, my grandmothers and my mom, that, you know, I I don't think you're disrespecting food by microwaving it. But I feel like you said, you're just kind of losing that you're losing that connection, you're losing the joy of, of preparing your food. And I think uh, one of my mentors and friends is Amy Chaplin. And I remember for a little while, I was shadowing her and kind of helping her out when she was launching her first book. And just Mm -hmm. the love that she put into her food was just so obvious. And it was like the first time that I had met someone in my professional life, that just seems so connected to every ingredient. Like she really cared about the source, where it came from, the seasonality of it all. And it just impacted me so much. And I try to channel that when I cook too. I love that. Seasonality is huge. Um, We are organic farmers and we sell at the farmer's market. And oh my word, the taste and flavor is so different than getting at the grocery store. So I'm going to have to snag her book. Oh my God. You, you have to, it's, it's literally, she won the James Beard award for it. And she has a follow-up book too, that I, I believe also on the James Beard award. Oh my She's gosh. just phenomenal. She's so knowledgeable. And I think for people who aren't used to cooking the plant-based way, they might open up her books and they might seem, you know, a little bit overwhelming because she doesn't use anything processed, um, which is like I said, how I like to cook. Mm-hmm. So you can look at her book and see it as, Oh my God, this is too much. I can't. But really, it's the way she prepares food is actually quite simple. So even though she's doing everything from scratch, she's not she's not doing much to it to make the flavor mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and she just incri- uh, includes like a whole glossary of information and tons of tons of tips on cooking plant based in her book. So they're they're awesome resources. Awesome. OK, so speaking of process, do you consider tofu and, and um, tempeh processed? Not in the traditional sense. No. I mean, of course they're a little processed because it's not a soybean growing on a vine, Um, but they're not manipulated to the point where they're just like some Franken food. Um, I definitely would not put tofu on the same level as a beyond burger. I think the ingredients are minimal and it's minimally processed. And, Mm -hmm. you know, if you look at the ingredients on a package of tofu, there's probably like four things, three things on there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, totally agree. So do you do seitan? And if so, do you have a tip on it, on how to uh, make it? I wish I did. I actually have cooked seitan a lot in culinary school. We actually made it from scratch um, mm-hmm. a bunch of times. I'm personally not a fan. So because of that, I don't really use it in my work. Um, I'm not a fan because it actually mimics the texture of meat a little too well for me. And I get kind of freaked out. <laughs> so it's so weird. I had a, like a chicken fried, like a chicken in quotes, fried Santan sandwich years ago. And I was like, this is chicken. Like, yeah. don't tell me it's not. It's I know. chicken chicken. I know. I can't. I, it's oh. so funny how that happens. Like when you go long enough without eating something, you don't even want like, I'm not really interested in Beyond Burgers and Impossible Burgers, not because like they're highly processed. Yes. So that's part of it. But also because I'm like, I don't really want to eat something that tastes like a hamburger. Like I'm over it. <laughs> so Same. Haven't even tried it. Um, jackfruit almost does the same to me. And lion's mane mushrooms. The texture of that is kind of like shredded chicken to me. <laughs> so it's super weird. But um, they are so delicious. The lion's mane mushrooms. Okay. So what is your, in your opinion, what is the best way to cook tofu? 
Okay. So I'm a big fan of freezing tofu first. Okay. So you come home from the grocery store, you have your package of tofu, you don't open it. You literally put the whole thing in the freezer, mm -hmm. let it come to, you know, let it freeze completely, take it out the next day, defrost it. It kind of makes it more porous. So it absorbs everything a little better. You can also squeeze out the water really easily. So, you know, when you buy tofu fresh and you don't freeze it, you have to do the like stack book thing. And yeah. it's kind of annoying when you freeze it, you literally just like pulled it over the the sink and gently squeeze and the water just like pours out and you don't have to press it. So I love that for convenience alone. Um, and then, like I said, it becomes more porous and it changes the texture. So it makes it a little chewier, which I really like. Yeah, um, if you're going to do tofu, like the normal way, definitely press it first. Like I said, you want to put it on a cookie sheet, um, put another cookie sheet on top and then put a few heavy books and let it sit for like 15, 20 minutes for some of the water to come out. And then, um, you can marinate it, but you certainly don't have to. And then I like to bake it. So I just like make a, a mixture. Usually I do like tamari, either rice vinegar, or a rice vinegar or apple cider vinegar. Um, I do some garlic powder, some nutritional yeast to kind of make this like little, you know, sauce. And then I pour it over and then I roast it at 400 degrees, usually for about, I don't know, like 20, 25 minutes. I cube it or put it in slabs. Mm -hmm. And I use that throughout the week, like mm -hmm. with stir fries, with sandwiches, just giving that to my kids for dinner. That's usually yeah. what I do. Got it. Yeah. I ended up freezing tofu just because I, and I accidentally bought too much and I, I kind of am like a freezer. I try to freeze everything. <laughs> I'm just like, well, we'll see how this turns out. You know, the texture, how, how much it changes. And then in, in between that, I had found out that that's actually a technique um, of cooking it. And then I pulled it out and you're right. It's super porous and definitely more tough, which I think gives it, um, I don't know, a better mouthfeel. And then also another question I was going to ask you is if you think it's necessary to press, because I have not been pressing it for years, like way back in the day when I went plant-based I did, but now I don't. And I just get, cause I'm really lazy. So I just get the extra firm and just hope for the best. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it depends what you want. Like if you want it to get like super crispy, you kind of have to take, yeah. but I never understood, like, I guess like what I just said, pressing it and then pouring marinade on it. I guess it's just less watery um, when yeah. you do it that way. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, there are definitely days where I don't freeze it and I don't press it. I just take like a clean kitchen towel and I try to like just blot it and to remove some of the moisture mm -hmm. um, just mm -hmm. so it's not waterlogged and squishy. Yeah. Um, but I don't always have the time to press it or the desire. So, you know, you don't have to. Okay. Got it. My son eats it straight out of the container. It is, oh <laughs> it is weird. It is weird, but he loves it. It's just so weird. <laughs> um, okay. What is your favorite vegan dessert? Um, I'm a fan of like an old school, like hippie cookie, <laughs> like anything um, with like tons of like oats and seeds in it. I like live um, for that. I also love apple pie. So okay. if it's like a well executed vegan apple pie, I'm all about it. Oh, both sound really good. <laughs> oh man. The, the more hippie, I think a cookie can be the better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. I just like some, some people are like, Oh, give me the old fashioned chocolate chip cookie and it has nothing. I mean, it does have something to do with health, of course, but like mostly like that's just, I love just biting into something with like pumpkin yeah. seeds and raisins and cinnamon and just like, Oh my God, it's so good. Well, it's satisfying compared to the more refined, you know, like chocolate that just melts in your mouth and the sugar just dissolves and the mm -hmm. flour just kind of disintegrates. Like it's so much more satisfying yeah, for your for mouth sure. and for your stomach. So mm -hmm. totally agree on that. Um, <clears throat> all right. This might be hard, but what is your favorite food? Oh, pasta. <laughs> I know that's like not the right answer, but like anyone who follows me on Instagram knows I, the thing about pasta is like, yes, it's refined flour. You know, I, I do try to have whole wheat flour sometimes, whole wheat pasta sometimes. I do dabble in the lentil pasta, the chickpea yeah. pasta. But there is just something so magnificent about like a really good <laughs> dish of pasta. And of course, since I'm plant-based, there's always like tons of vegetables in there. And if it's yeah. not directly in the pasta, you can be sure I'm eating like a mound of broccoli rabe on the yeah. side. And um, I just try to, you know, do it sparingly, you know, I eat pasta probably once a week, and I do it completely guilt free. And it makes me so happy. So that's oh my, my favorite food. <laughs>
that's pretty high up on my list too. And especially if you, if you make it, I mean, that's a whole next level. Like yeah. the mouth feel, oh my gosh, I, I have all the fancy stuff to make it. I need to, that just totally inspired oh, me. Oh, me too. I know. I got it all like when I got married before I had children and now I have kids and it's just like, Oh weird. yeah. I don't think I have yeah. made homemade pasta since Cohen was born. It's been three and a half years. Yeah. We busted um, it out on new year's and it was like the greatest thing. I was so oh happy. Oh my gosh. <laughs> the mushroom filled ravioli right now would be bomb. Um, yes. And you could even make like fun pastas of your own with like spinach powder. And like, you know, you could put all the different things to make it just as fancy as you would in a package. Um, so mm-hmm. if you guys have not dove into um, making your own pasta and you want a fun thing to do with your kids, maybe you look into doing that because it yeah, is for sure. delicious. For sure. um, okay, just a few more questions. Dairy products, dairy substitutes. What Do you have any favorites? Do you drink them? What is your family like? Um, so I try to stay away from process things as best as I can. So I, I'm not saying that soy milk or almond milk is processed. I, I do, I do use it. I usually mostly use it in my coffee and I'll use it to make oatmeal um, and sometimes in baking, but that's really, really it. And in terms of non-dairy cheeses, it's really difficult to find something out there that tastes really good and where the ingredients aren't like crazy. Um, once in a while, I will have BioLife brands. I think their stuff is pretty decent. Um, I like Miyoko's and I've recently had the opportunity to work with Forager. They're uh, releasing a line of vegan cheeses and I'm working with them now. And I'm very impressed. I have to say, I'm not being paid to say this. I genuinely really like them. So they're coming out with like a mozzarella, a queso fresco, um, a Jack cheese and Parmesan. And they're organic, which is nice. I think they're the first vegan cheese on the market that's completely organic. And the ingredient list is pretty clean. So, you know, if you are looking for a treat, a food item to have once in a while, those are good options. I also make like a homemade cashew mozzarella sauce, which I feel like, you know, you can put on nachos, you can put on your pizza. That's usually what I do. So, well, we're going to need that recipe. (laughs) Uh, I actually, use it's not my own. I use the recipe from Chloe Coscarelli's Italian book. It's in the back. That page is like, like splattered. I've made that recipe like once a week for, you know, however many years that cookbook's been out. So, okay. Which cookbook is that? I know of her, but I don't know. It's Chloe's Italian kitchen. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So if you're a a pasta person, you have to get that book. It's super good. Yeah. I think, um, I think Miyoko's does melt. Well, I've never had wildlife, wildlife, wildlife. Wildlife and um, is Forager currently the one that has like the spread spreadable ones? They have yogurts out right now, okay, um, cashew okay. based yogurts, and they have non dairy milks, and they have a sour cream that's pretty good. Okay. Um, I was using that the other day; it's it's pretty yummy. Um, so they have a few things, but this is their first entry into cheese at all. And yay for organic! That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yay. So I was excited to see that. That's very much needed. Okay. Um. Last question before I ask my question that I ask everybody. Um, what are some fast, easy meals without the mess and feeling like your kitchen exploded multiple times a day? <laughs> um, I think tacos is like my go-to for that. Basically, mm-hmm. I take a can of beans. I drain it like a can of black beans. I drain it. I saute it with a little bit of garlic. Um, I put some cumin and coriander in there. So I have that. And then in another pan, I'll just like saute up some vegetables. So some days it's cauliflower, some days it's peppers and onions, um, you know, whatever veggie you like in your taco. And then I just put that on corn tortillas with avocado. And I feel like it is like the easiest, fastest, nutritional, most nutritionally complete meal. And the nice thing about tacos is that they're like customizable. So your kids, if they don't eat one thing, they don't, you know, it's not like some assembled meal, they can kind of put in whatever they like. So oh, it's family okay. friendly. Too. Great tip. Okay, so Lauren, where can we find you? So I am on Instagram at Lauren underscore Kretzer, K-R-E-T-Z-E-R. Or you can find me on my website, www.laurenkretzer.com. Love it. And this is something that I ask all of my guests, because I try to teach people how to live this way. And I want to know what you think a holistic life means. 
I think a holistic life is when you are taking into consideration all aspects, you know, so your spirituality, your food, your body, your mind, you know, everything combined, you know, everything is related. What we put into our body ultimately affects our health. It ultimately affects um, our mindset. And I feel like when everything is in sync, that is holistic living. And it's an amazing feeling when it happens. So heck yeah. I think we're all striving for it. I love that. Yeah, Thank it's a journey. So much. We are Thank so you. excited to connect with you, Lauren, and it was an honor to have you on. Thank today. you so much for having me. It's been fun. I'm over here cheering you on because you just finished another episode of The Urban Pharmacy. For today's show notes, head on over to theurbanpharmacy.com and be sure to join us inside our private Facebook group called The Urban Pharmacy where we share inspiration, live trainings, and holistic living tips to help you build community and the healthy lifestyle that you've always wanted. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you hit that subscribe button and please consider leaving us a five-star review. Before we connect again on the next show, follow me on Instagram at the urban pharmacy. That's urban with an H and pharmacy with an F. And I can't wait to hear your wellness journey as we get to know each other better. You know, there's truly no better time than now to level up your life. And I am so proud of you for showing up today. Until next time, be well, Health Crusader.